Hey, it's Jim. How you doing? So I'm going to be talking um, about building software communities here and uh, just basically going over some pictures. I like taking pictures of community events and uh, talking about some stories and some lessons I've learned doing uh, community development. So the first thing is the number one thing you got to consider when building a community is people because I, yeah, I just can't think of anything that's more important than that. I mean, a lot of things we'll talk about here, um, you can do in parallel, you can make all kinds of dependencies, that's fine. But really, you got to start off with what type of community um, you know, that you want to build, who are the people that you want to attract. Um, you need to attract participants, you need to attract, contri attract uh, you know, contributors, uh, users, um, that's one group. Of people, the second group of people you need to attract is leaders, managers, organizers, people that can help you build and grow and scale. But also, and this is not really well well discussed a lot of times, there's a group of people that, um, on the negative, they will get in the way. Uh, you will attract trolls. There's no question about it. Um, and so you have to deal with that. You have to be able to manage. Um, human relationships. That's what community building is all about. It's project management. Granted, all the different project management skills apply, but you really have to um, be a people manager as well. Um, but there's also another thing that's also not really well discussed, I think, is that there's a little secret here um, that communities, you know, all human beings gather, all all cultures, languages, it doesn't matter where you were born, when you were born, go back thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Um, people gather, human beings gather, they come together, they network, they collaborate uh, to build something or just to survive, right? This is completely natural to us. So you as a community builder, you can leverage this. You can use this as one of your tools to tap into the natural innate desire for people to gather. Um, this guy here in this picture, his name is Sandesh. Sandesh Rao is a friend of mine, and he is um, also a vice president of AI Ops at Oracle. And he is really understands photography. He really understands the concept of taking a picture of somebody. It sounds so simple, but you know he includes himself in these pictures. He's the king of the selfies at Oracle, right? But there's several hundred people behind him there. They all know him. They all love him. They all want to be in one of Sandesh's selfies. He takes thousands of these things, right? And um, I really learned a lot about. Um, communities from doing work with Sandesh and traveling with him. This particular event is in Bangalore. We were on a Groundbreakers India Yatra. Uh, yatra means tour or journey, basically. And um, so we toured 10 cities in India in 2019. Um, it's obviously in the before times when we were allowed out of the house. So, um, but if you want to cut cleanly across language and culture barriers, which is something you need to do when you build communities, pick up a camera. It, it's like magic and video works as well, but uh, my preference is still photography. So, uh, so that's it. Leverage, leverage the natural innate desire for humans to gather as one of your main community building tools. It's very, very powerful. The next is planning. Although I said before that people gather naturally, and this is, you know, genetic, right? We have to collaborate to survive uh, and to thrive. Communities don't necessarily scale very well without some management. Uh, you got all kinds of issues to deal with. You got distance issues, language and culture and uh, equipment and infrastructure, uh, schedules, um, conflicts, governance, all the different things that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, that involves active management and and how you manage something, you start by planning, right? And so these two guys in this picture here, Shoji Haraguchi and Matthew Dons, two of my uh, good friends from Tokyo, we were planning. And actually, Shoji has got Duke there as well as the 
the Java mascot. So I, I, so Shoji, Matthew, and I were planning this bar camp on conference in Tokyo in 2010, and we did it on Twitter. We literally planned the whole conference on Twitter. Matthew, who I didn't know at the time, contacted me and Shoji. Um, and he was a part of the Linux community. I knew him, but actually we weren't friends, you know, close at all. And he he pinged me and um, on Twitter. <laughs> he says he wants to do a bar camp and, you know, wants me and Shoji to help. And so <laughs> he kind of just came out at us, you know. And we thought it was a cool idea. And so we planned the whole thing on Twitter and everyone could see what we were doing, you know. And um, so bar camp is a, is an unconference where, where it's one of the, it's a certain specific format. And, um, you know, you, there's a lot of planning to do the whole concept of an unconference is the participants make the schedule, the participants run the conference, right? As opposed to you as the organizer selecting the speakers. So it's just a way of getting everybody to participate. But, you know, even though it's sort of a self-organizing conference, there actually is a lot of overt organization that needs to take place to make it happen. Um, you know, things like, do you have a building? <laughs> do you have food? Do you have security? Do you have badging? Um, do you, I mean, do you, uh, so are there any expenses here? Do you have any egress and access issues? Um, do you have um, um, any other special needs uh, that needs to be taken care of? Um so there's the, 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 there's a lot of um, active management that has to go into um, creating an unconference, which just magically, spontaneously manages itself, uh, which is a bit of a um, funny thing. But um, if you're building an open source project when you are, are doing your planning, think in terms of you know two key concepts: is open communications and open development. You're talking in the open and you're building in the open. And you start that process by planning and um, even unconferences need planning. Transparency. I, I talked a little bit about this just now um, in the planning section about planning in the open. Transparency is the concept of you know, do everything in the open. Get outside. The concept here is you really can't build a community from behind a firewall or from inside your house. Just like right now in 2021, we're all in our house, um, you know, building virtual communities, um, which pale in comparison to real communities. And I, I think the the jury is really in, you know, on that. Um, so uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, I learned a lot about transparency from Denise. Um, these, these people in the, in the picture here, my friends, uh, from long ago, Max and Denise and Simon and, uh, Ted and Matt. Um, but I, 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 I learned a lot from, uh, Denise Cooper and Simon Phipps about specifically about transparency. They taught me all about open source when I joined Sun and, um, they got me into a fair amount of trouble as well. And so <laughs> the two very big troublemakers. Um, but um, yeah, no, we did a lot. And at that time, they were leading the effort with some others to build um, blogs at Oracle. I'm sorry, blogs at sun.com, which obviously became blogs at Oracle.com. So we used blogs at sun.com to as our as our platform to do communications with all of the communities that we were building at the time so open solaris and java and spark and um you know netbeans and open office and juxta and all these all these different communities that we were building at sun at the time uh, all the engineers were on blogs at sun.com having open conversations um and it was really, really cool. So, um, and obviously Tim Bray there was heavily involved in the construction of, of that project as well, you know, blogs.sun.com. So I, I learned a lot about transparency from these people. Um, and actually Matt, you know, Thompson over there on the right, um, uh, I worked with Matt at Oracle as well. He rejoined Oracle, uh, um, a couple of years ago before going to Google. 
And so, um, yeah, so just try and get as much of your planning outside and as much of your infrastructure outside and so you can work outside. In other words, you, the construction process itself takes place outside. That's really the, the, um, that's really the overall bit there. Participation is something that I think the Japanese do really well. This is an image here from um, uh, Tokyo. A couple of my friends, Takashi and Yohei, here, and um, this is a, the you know it's Java User Group is their cross community conference. And uh, what's really interesting about this is they specifically you know the guys there, my friends in the you know blue shirts at the organizing committee. There's like 20 of them that run this conference. It is a non-trivial number of people. You really understand if you're a community organizer and you go to these events. I always look for the other organizers to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing it. And it's it's like the Indian community. They really throw a lot of organizers at making these events happen. And you can tell. You can tell an event that's run by the community versus an event that's run by a company. So this is a true community event here. What's interesting about this is um, how they implement it. Um, so this – you know, so the day starts very early in the morning. I think it starts like 8 o'clock, right? And there's no keynote. Okay, you just start with sessions. They have thousand people on one floor of this, you know, conference center. It, it's a very large place, and you have just multiple sessions, multiple simultaneous, you know, sessions running in parallel. And um, at the, you know, it's very, very traditional. Okay, and then you have side conversations and hallway conversations. But at the end of the day. Um, you actually what they run is you know lightning talks so they have a party basically so they bring in sushi and it's really good sushi right um and they have pizza and beer and all this stuff as well so there's plenty of things for everybody to eat and drink and it's a several hour you know party but they have lightning talks right and it's not just one or two or three and they're not trivial they're hysterically funny and they go on for like it's like 15 minutes, you know, some of them. Um, and everyone gets really, really involved in this. And I think it, it just it just works, you know. I mean, you hear these conversations, oh, you did this last year, what are you gonna do this year? Kind of thing, and all that. And, you know, this is just a, a very simple way of building relationships. What you want to do as a community manager is to help people to to form trust relationships, to, to basically earn their way based on merit. Right, And the more ways that you can offer the community to participate in your community, the better. And this is just a very simple idea to do. Um, and they do it very, very well. They have a huge amount of participation um, in, their, in their community, specifically at this event. It's great fun. Contributions is something that as a community manager or even a developer, if you're on a project, that's, you know, you build communities to attract people. Number one, well, those people bring something with them, right? They're not just showing up to hang out. They're, they're there to contribute contribute you know, to contribute you know, to the community and they're, and they're there to get something out of the community. It's a completely reciprocal relationship, right? Um, but the key for you as a as a community builder is you need to define the contributions that you want and you need to get specific you make a list you know label it this is what we want this is what we need you know we need code we need you know test suites we need you know presentations we need user groups we need you know bug reports here's a, you know bug bounty program uh we need some development tools these you know this stuff is old uh would love some distributions how about some university courses we need translations as well because it's only in english you know we want to have german and spanish and chinese and you know whatever make a list it's that simple but but expect the community to like say, well, we want to do this and that and that over there as well. And that's the whole point of putting it outside. And again, transparency. Um, the community won't necessarily agree with what you want 
you know, usually it will, and the, if the list is general enough, right? But everyone's going to want to do their own thing as well. So that's good. You know, you want to just add that stuff on there. So get specific with the contributions that you want to attract. Um, Stephen um, Han is the guy on the right-hand side of this image, and he's a uh, one of the kernel developers from Solaris, the Open Solaris project at Sun years ago. And uh, he also has a PhD in physics, so he is a um, very serious scientist. And um, he, he was looking for code contributions, right? To, to, to him, in his particular job, He's you know at his particular level of the system. He's way down there in the kernel. Um, he used to tell me that you know we everyone knows who's contributing. You know, I mean, I'd walk into his office you know someday and I I I so I'd say such and such name in the community and he would go over to his computer and check the gate you know to see because this that's how he knows this person whether this person is contributing code or not because that's at the level that he was at you know very very high level. Um, or low level in the kernel, depending on how you look at it. Rich Green is the guy on the left, and uh, Rich was um, the EVP of um, software at the time this picture was taken. So he had he had all of Java and Solaris and everything. Um, I think he's he's more known as a Java guy, but both of them understood because I worked with them for years. Both of them understood um, at a very very strong level the value of people the value of the community bringing contributions into the community. And so, um, yeah, so you can also, um, when you have lists of things that you are looking for from the community, you can, you, over time, start to, um, you know, call attention to, like, have recognition programs and, you know, you can basically reward people for their contributions. At Oracle, Oracle has um, um, multiple programs that I've worked on, the ACE, it's, you know, Oracle ACEs and Groundbreaker Ambassadors and um, the Java Champions. Those are the three programs that I've been involved with. And they're basically recognition programs, right? Um, you, this is a way for people to contribute to the overall community and to have the company recognize that. You know, um, tending to conferences and and doing things like that, and um, it's a way for the community to sort of earn their way into the community by contributing. So, um, you know, I, I've had experience now with both, with you know, code contributions and with Solaris, and also recognition programs at Oracle. Um, so, presentations. Um, this is an image of me in, in China. I was an MC Master of Ceremonies at this conference. It was a one-day event. Uh, I think it was a two-day event at that time. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, there's about a 1,000 or so people that you know come to the event. There's, there's probably about 800 or so in the keynote room. And then we streamed it out live to uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in China. Uh, my point here, though, is when you're giving presentations, sp speak with your own voice. Don't speak in corporate speak. You know, when I was on stage there, I knew obviously that I'm an Oracle employee, and I have to reflect the the the, the overall message, the overall framework of the of the company. However, I'm talking to engineers, all right, and so you don't have to sound like an executive who's speaking executive speak if you're talking to developers speak like a developer it's just first of all just use a plain voice right um so i was talking about hacking i was talking about free and open source i was talking about the different programs that my team at the time was running um to you know developer you know program so speak with your own voice very very important be genuine just you know speak like a normal human being <laughs> um and focus on code, focus on contributions, focus on action. And when you're done with the keynote, stick around. Um, you know, a lot of times people are doing keynotes, they're famous and they, you know, they're busy and they land and they do their keynote and they split, right? So, um, I, but, you know, you can really make an impression if you stick around. I, I get this great story. I, I was at, I think this is also in 2018. I was up in, in Tokyo and I went to a Linux conference and Linus was there. 
And I said, oh, shit, that's great because I, I want to meet him. I had never had an opportunity to actually meet him. Um, and so I was cool. So I went to his keynote and he did like a panel interview, sort of a, a session keynote. And after he was done, he stuck around and there was this long line of Japanese engineers to, you know, that wanted to meet him. He was there for like 25 minutes, signing shirts and signing things and, and then telling stories and just hanging out with these developers. And I thought that was, was really, really cool. Um, you, you do see that at conferences, but many times you see the keynote person split, right? So I thought that was really cool. And I wanted to meet him, so I just waited. I just waited till I was the last one in line, basically. And I introduced myself and I said, Hey, Linus, how you doing? This is, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm uh, you know, Jim Grisanzio. I was the Open Solaris community manager. And then he just looked at me and he, he said, Oh, I'm, I'm really very sorry. <laughs> I just said, yeah, I know I am too. But, you know, hey, Linux won and, um, you know, an open Solaris died. You know? it, it, it didn't make it. It didn't survive the collapse of, um, of Sun. The project was canceled, um, obviously. So, um, but I had, I had many, many Linux friends and at that time, you know, when I was doing it and I learned a lot from the open, from, you know, from the Linux community. Uh, from their history, the things that they did right, things that they did wrong, and et cetera. And I told, actually, I, I was another story. I I, um, I told him that um, I, you know, mistakenly announced the Open Solaris project. I was the one that sent the the initial announcement about Open Solaris out. At the time, I was the community manager. And what we did is we put a website up, you know, before we announced, you know, the opening of the code. Um well, I mean, everyone everyone knew we were doing this, but what we did essentially was we basically, um, you know, you know, said, you know, sign up here, and we'll let you know when we actually release the code. Basically, very very common, right? So, but we didn't. Somebody made the mistake of not taking a look at the database of all the of all the email addresses, and so you know, you know, we didn't clean it up. Somebody put the Linux kernel mailing list in there, and when I sent my announcement out, it it went, you know, opening. This is Open Solaris. You know, we're here. You know, it's great stuff. That announcement that went to the Linux kernel mailing list, unbelievable. I almost died. I ran into Keith Waslowski's office and I said, Keith, what do I do? Keith was, he was one of the engineers in the project at Sun. And, I, I, and he actually came from the Linux community. I literally ran into his office. This is in, this is in Menlo Park. Yeah, I said, Keith, what do I do? I just spammed the Linux kernel mailing list. And he says, oh, my God, why did you do that, Jim? And I said, well, I didn't know I did it. No one, you know, I just sent my mail out to the, you know, to the database. You know, oh. So lesson number one, if you're going to announce, if you're going to make a big announcement and you're going to take email addresses from the Internet, it's wise to look at the email addresses that you've actually collected. And like clean up a couple. So I told him this story. I told Linus this story and he laughed, thought it was really funny. Uh, I didn't think it was funny at the time, but I can laugh at it now. And he said, well, he, and he said something really interesting to me. He, he said, well, I hope that, you know, when you sent that mail, which is obviously a mistake, I hope that you were treated okay on the list. And I said, yeah, I was actually, I was kind of surprised people people were cool about it. You know, I apologized, obviously. I said, you know, I'm an asshole, but they were kind of cool about it. And they started asking me questions, you know? And um, so, you know, I, I am on the Linux kernel mailing list. That's, that's what I'm going to live in infamy, I guess. So the point is presentations, especially key notes, stick around, speak with the genuine voice. Yeah. Okay, we're going to stay at conferences here because, you know, when you're building community, you're at a lot of conferences, quite frankly. Um, and this is also an open Solaris bit here. So um, the first point about this is when you go to conferences, you don't only have to only you, so you don't only have to give sessions. Okay, you can um, participate in sessions. You can ask questions. You can do engage in any number of hallway conversations. Um, you could do lightning talks, right? Like I said earlier about the Japanese community, 
Um, all these things are perfectly valid reasons to go to conferences. And if you're a community builder, you need to go and talk to a lot of people. Now, uh, Simon, Simon Phipps, uh, my friend there on the left, um, you, I was actually, I met up with him in Brussels in 2019, um, at, uh, we were at Fodsdam and I had never been to Fodsdam and he told me that hey, this conference is just two days and it's at this university. It's massive. It's huge. It's like 20,000 people go to this thing, but the, all the activities are a full week long, you know, um, because, you know, you're in Brussels. It's a very cool city. Lots of cafes and restaurants and these, you know, this old city and plenty of places to meet um, and have, you know, community meetings and have project meetings and just meet friends. Right. Um, and so it was really, really an interesting experience, you know, being there. And then I remembered, oh, we, you know, we did something like that in Portland in 2004, right? Because when we launched Open Solaris, we, we, it took us a year basically to you know, get the code ready and get the project ready before it opened. So it wouldn't just flop over. I mean, it took a fair amount of time. Um, and one of the things we did is we went to OSCON, which at the time was the premier open source conference in the world run by Tim O'Reilly right there in the middle. And, um, you see Bruno Souza there and Eric Raymond and Brian Bellendorf. And, and these are just some, just a very small, actually, number of open source um, sort of experts, luminaries, whatever, uh, you know, people who are sort of involved in the founding of the open source movement. Um, what we did is we, you know, we got Simon and Denise to sort of organize a meeting for us um, in a hotel. This is the Open Solaris project team. And we had like 20 of these guys. And we just said, you know, we all got in the room together and we just said, look, we're going to open this code. Everyone knows we're going to open this code. We got 10 million lines of code lying around. How do we do this? What's the best way of doing it? What do you think? You know, and we just had an open conversation and it was really, really good. It, it was, it was honest. They gave us honest feedback. We you know, went back and forth for hour. I think it was like three hours. Denise, was really critical in managing the overall flow of the conversation. She really does these sort of facilitation meetings very, very well. And uh, cause she, she really had all these relationships and she was able to pull these people together for us. And it was great. You know, that was not a part of, uh, that was not a part of OSCON. That was, a, it was sort of ancillary. We went, you know, we, you know, we did our own things at the conference, but we were also there to meet people to help us open this code, right? These experts. Uh, and, you know, we really, really appreciated it. And um, I actually still have my notes from that event. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a, a huge amount in that event. So the point is you go to conferences, you go to sessions, but there's many other reasons to go to a conference. A lot of times people say, oh, you know, my boss won't approve me. You know, be you know, you know, for travel because I can't go to this conference because I'm not doing a session. Man, that's just that's brain dead. That's just idiotic. There's a hundred things you can do there. So, um, yeah, that's conferences. So, I, I spoke about keynotes um, a little bit earlier um, as well. Obviously, we're sticking to the conference theme. And one of the things that is great to do if you're going to run a conference is to put the community on stage, the whole freaking community. Okay. So, Stephen Chin is so if you see Duke there right in the middle off to the right hand side, you see a guy wearing, he's got a you know, microphone around his head and he's got this uh, red, like a Dracula suit or something like that. That's Stephen. I used to work for Stephen. He's a real smart guy. And, um, very much a community guy, very much an open source guy, Java guy as well. And uh, I worked for him for um, about three years or so. I was really, really pissed off that he left Oracle, but, <laughs> but um, hey, what are you going to do? Um, so anyway, he, you know, he used to run this community keynote event at Oracle Open World. Now, Oracle Open World is just big, massive corporate conference, right? A lot of suits there, but 
you know, it, it's a big vendor event, right? But Oracle also had Oracle Code 1, which was the former Java one. So that's more obviously of a, of a developer event. And then we had Code 1, which was yet another conference that Oracle, they just munged it all together <laughs> into one massive conference. So Stephen says, you know, we need something for the community to run themselves, basically, right? So we had this... Um, community keynote you know it was the last day the last morning and they would as you see they were all dressed up in like you know space avengers or whatever it is the you know the avengers thing there and they would each year they would do like a skit right it's a multi-hour skit and they'd be talking about something about code or you know in this you know one year they would do something like a star wars theme or something like that this year it was it was with this but but everyone on stage is from the community, right? And they would rehearse this kind of thing. And and I could just, you know, my eye scanning. I know about half of these guys. They're from like 20 different countries on stage there, you know. Really, really cool. And um, so, you know, actually when I, actually when I went to um, um, FOSS India, um, one of the things, you know, which was an open source conference years ago, um, uh, through Denise Cooper, actually, and and I remember at the very last session that you know the keynote speaker was sort of wrapping up. Basically, this is a great week. Good luck, blah blah blah. And he brought the entire community up onto stage. Everybody in the audience, basically, up onto stage. So all the audience seats were empty, and it was really just a really really cool thing to do to demonstrate that. Everybody is a part of the community. You can all be on stage. You should all be on stage at one point or another because, you know, you, you're an expert at one thing or another, you know. And I think it just it was a very, very powerful thing. Well, this thing here with this, um, you know, community event here that you're looking at here was, was kind of similar, right? Um, now in the audience, there's, there's several thousand people in the audience, but there's a smaller group on stage. Um, but the point is... You know, everyone on stage comes from the community, and it was their keynote. It wasn't just a, a corporate keynote. It wasn't a demo. It was just fun. Um, and uh, but but you know, they ran it. So infrastructure is an important part of of uh, being a community manager. I learned a lot about infrastructure um, doing multiple different types of of communities. This particular um, thing here, this particular image, this is our streaming stage. You can see I got the camera there, and I got my so that's my camera, and that's my box in the yellow. You know, that's my yellow um, kit. And that's my friend there, Javed Mohammed, my, you know, also my colleague at Oracle. We're in Singapore in 2019, and uh, we've got audio, we get video, we stream interviews live, right? So, um, and we it was very nice. We had like 100 megabits per second up, which is very nice because it's Singapore, right? It was very, very nice. You can stream nice quality with that one time i went to a conference and they they wanted me to stream live and so i did a little speed test on the on the line and it was one megabit per second it's, guys i it's not, i can't make a phone call on that honestly i mean we really need to do better than that it's an infrastructure issue right um you need to plan for that because you know 100 megabits per second is actually going to be pretty expensive at a, at a conference. So, um, yeah, um, all, all the things that you need, you have to consider all the different infrastructure things you're going to need. Um, here I've just, this is just kit to, to do audio visual stuff, but you know, you need source code repos, you need, you know, bug, you know, testing tools, you need, you know, test farms, you know, all this kind of, all this infrastructure, websites, wikis, mailing lists, right? That's infrastructure. It's the physical stuff that you need um, to, um, to engage people, you know, to engage developers. Now, years ago, you had to build all that stuff yourself. So now it's, you know, we have the cloud. And so we have things like GitHub, where the, the centralized platforms that have more and more of the tools that you need, um, but you got to use them, you, you have to actually use them. And, um, um, you know, think about security issues, everything. Um, backups as well, like, for instance, this particular 
this particular image is from Singapore, but just before this, we were in Dubai and um, I, someone knocked over my camera and broke it, broke on a concrete floor. And fortunately, we had a backup camera that we can do it, um, that we can keep going. So you have a certain amount of equipment, you're going to need a certain amount of backups because things will break. Kit will get lost, right? It'll get shipped to some different city that, you know, so all kinds of things happen. So um, make a list. That's basic project management right there. So as you're making a list for your physical equipment, think big, right? Uh, build something big. You know, you, all the demos, experiences, that's one of the things that our team handled this particular. And actually, you can see the streaming stage there off to the right. Um, that's, you know, that's our stage back there. Uh, the guy in front here is um, Chris. Um, and he is a friend of mine at the... Um, um, at the company, you know, what Oracle still, you know, I still work with him there, you know, Chris Benson. And I really like Chris because he thinks big. He says, Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could like, and then you got to sit down and you got to just listen to what he says, because it's going to be big. You know, he, he's, he's an engineer and he loves, but I think more importantly, he's just a tinkerer. That's just who he is as who he is as a, you know, as a person. And he's got that Pi supercluster there, largest in the world, right? And um, it was the talk of the whole conference, right? This is at this is the developer lounge. So our team, you know, we had us, we had the streaming stage, we had Chris's stuff, we had like ten different you know, demo stations in the developer lounge, massive space in Moscone. Our team managed that in collaboration with other teams, but we were responsible for delivering it. And Chris was, you know, obviously a big, big part of that. And um, he's great at explaining these things. He's great at, because um, he's obviously technical, he can talk to developers, and, but he, he built the damn thing, right? He put it together, plugged everything in, everything. Um, and he had, there were other people involved. I'm not just putting it all on Chris, but um, the point is to think big. Because, you know, especially if you're like us at Oracle, you have some resources to spend. Do something cool with it, right? This this machine here got millions of views, impressions and views online and various social media and also news outlets as well. Um, so that's infrastructure, right? Think big. Hack fests, I really... I got it. I really enjoy these things. Um, this is a program. Uh, this is also an idea, right? You can do this as, as just one of the tools to build community is to run a hack fest. Um, you know, way back in Open Solaris, we used to run install fests. You don't really do that now because you know stuff is so easy to install. But but you know, back when you know open you know solaris itself was was very years ago it was very hard to put solaris on a laptop solaris was was meant to run on really big computers not small computers and so when we ported it to x86 you know even you know solaris 10 you kind of had to have a little bit of knowledge and have the right drivers and stuff and get into the command line and do some stuff to get it running on on a laptop well, Open Solaris really solved that problem because it made it, it, because it made installing easy, right? Um, but we used to run install fests. Again, you, you know, you get a, a room, you bring in twenty people, fifty people from the community. Yeah, you, you tell everybody to bring their laptops. You got your CDs. You start installing this stuff. You know, if someone runs into a problem, you work with them right on the site, right? You know, um, and. We did the same thing with 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 your bug bounty you know, programs too. You bring everybody in. Here's the system. Find the bugs, right? But you're together. You're physically together. And then you have lunch and dinner and all these kinds of things. You drink and everyone gets drunk and you know it's fun. That's a community building tool. That's helping people meet each other around something. Well, these hack fests are the same thing. And this particular event is in Bangalore. And Again, 2019. Um, so it was a program we used to run, Oracle Code Innovate. And what you see there is um, about 15 engineers from Oracle, and the rest of them are from Cisco. 
And we basically went to Cisco and, you know, this was for a three day event, intensive all day, every day, where we're going to hack on Oracle cloud to solve some of your problems, whatever your, you know, whatever your problems were. So the customer, the customer engineers had a bunch of projects that they want to do for whatever reason, right? We come in and say, Hey, let's solve these problems with Oracle cloud. Right. And so, but we're going to do this in a way where we're going to split up into teams. We're going to have a competition. We're going to be, so we're going to have judging. We're going to have standups, a complete agile scrum, you know, framework. Right. Uh, man, these people loved it. It's, it was so much fun. We did about, I don't know, 20 of these things. The program is still going on, but I'm not involved with it anymore. And I, I just, I loved it. I was the scrum master, you know, and I, I take pictures as well. And I would do interviews, video interviews. And so um, great stuff. And, um, you, you know, the customer solves some problems. You learned with the customer. You get a closer relationship with the customer. Um, if this were sort of an open thing, this was just you know, this was just between Oracle and Cisco, this particular thing. But you can do it in an open way as well, you know. Um, and I have many examples of that. And um, so it's it's just a just a great great event. Um, and they take it seriously. I mean, so at, actually, this particular event, I said, okay, we're going to start at eight. And we're going to end at five because there's lots of traffic in Bangalore and people have got to get home and you know. There's all kinds of issues around that, right? You talk about infrastructure, right? People were showing up at 6.30. They were leaving at 10 p.m. at night. I mean, it was nuts. It was really, really crazy. But And that's what happens when people love something, right? You as a community builder, what I learned is you can tap into that. That's a, you know, that's a part of the natural spirit that, you know, comes along with building communities. You've got a bunch of tools, you've got a bunch of processes, you've got a bunch of like events and things like that. But, but really what you're doing is you're plugging into the natural innate desire to gather and do something together. So Hackfest's on conferences, Kind of similar, actually. We, we so we use agile project management sort of a framework to run those hack fests. We also ran unconferences. Um, I've been involved in many, many unconferences, as you can tell. Um, and this particular one um, was 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 the Oracle Groundbreakers on conference, and this was in um, San Francisco at you know, 2019. The woman there with the megaphone is Lori LaRusso, and she is probably one of the best on-site community organizers I've ever met. She has a real ability to move people in a room, and that's no shit non-trivial. I mean... It, 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 I mean, it's one thing to be able to project your voice. It's another thing to be able to move people in the proper way so they feel included and, um, you know, um, to where they feel like they're, you know, can get behind what you're saying. You know, uh, Vincent Mayers is the guy on the right hand side there. Um, he and Lori and some others on the team you know, we were managing this. Vincent's a great guy. He's also, he's from the Java community. He's done, uh, he's a Java champion actually. Um, and he's, he's done um, enormous amounts of, of work of running conferences and stuff really highly, highly skilled. And, you know, behind the cameras about 150 or so people. And, um, you know, at the unconference, as again, those people, what Lori's pointing to, there are different sessions, and she's sort of describing the session. The you know, the people, the participants would write on the board. This is a typical unconference style. What they want to say, what they want to do, and Lori would assign them a room, and she would describe them and sort of say, "You want to go here? You do this. You do this. You do that. Here's the schedule. Go right." Um, now, in order to have that sort of open framework, Lori and Vincent and Linda and other people on the team had, had to do an enormous amount of pre-work to make the unconference seem like it was just spontaneously organized on site, which is um, kind of funny because it does take a lot of a lot of effort um, up front. 
So anyway, if you see Lori or Vincent around, that's who they are. They're really good friends. So governance is, um, you're going to run into governance if you going to run a serious community. Um, you don't need governance if you're going to run a small community or if you're going to run sort of like a program. Um, but if you're going to run a serious community that uh, is going to be taking contributions, you have all kinds of issues to consider. The social structure, you've got development frameworks mixing with social structures. You get engineering processes mixing with those social structures. You get leadership issues, um, conflict resolution. You're going to, if you're going to have a community of 20,000 people, you're going to have a certain amount of conflict. That's just human, right? Um, how are you going to resolve those conflicts? How are you going to elect your board, your board of directors or your governance board or community board or whatever you decide to call it? Um, there are many election frameworks and as we can see from the last few elections around the world, this is also a non-trivial thing. There's, you know, how are you going to get people elected? How are they going to run? Um, how are you going to, um, you get legal issues you know, with your know, code contributions, all this stuff. It's complex. It really is. I, I was involved with the creation of the Open Solaris um, Community Advisory Board initially, uh, which we developed as we were opening, basically. Um, and I found it, it was a good learning experience, not my expertise, certainly. I was somewhat at Solari, but I was involved. I was there, and I thought it was really cool. Um, one of the things I learned was, particularly from Simon and, and Roy, and Roy Fielding was on one of the boards. Um, you want to launch with some framework in place, but not complete. And, and in other words, let it evolve. You know, you know, there's certain things that have to evolve naturally, but you don't want to just have it a complete free for all. You want a certain framework in place. The second thing I learned is that the people, anybody can help write governance in the community. And it's just, you know, this is kind of the Apache style. You show up to do work and well, you're the expert, right? You know, if you're able to do that work and you show up and do it, then, you know, you're the one, you know, the, you're the one who gets it done. That is so liberating. I mean, when I discovered this, I just was, was my God. I mean, can you imagine if a company ran that way? I mean, it, people wouldn't hate their jobs so much. It is incredible. Um, really, really fell in love with that. But it is, it is complex stuff if you're going to run a serious community. So um, um, really you take that seriously and get, and try and, and, and encourage people who have this expertise, you know, to get involved. The next is leadership. And I, I have a, I have a love hate relationship with this word because I, I don't, um, you know, I just, I just do. I mean, I, so many of our leaders in this world do not deserve to be, you know, they don't deserve to have the term leader associated with them. So I, I, I just, my concept of leadership is the people who do real work. That's it. If you're doing real work, you're a leader in your field. If you get that title because of some relationship, you're not a leader. All right. And, you know, I, I feel very strongly about this and, um, I don't, um, necessarily think that a lot of people agree with me in my criticisms of people who are leaders that they have gotten there because of political reasons. Um, that's abhorrent as far as I'm concerned. Um, so if you're building a community, you need leaders, you, you need to be able to spot them. And I, I've always found it fairly easy to spot a leader. You look among the group and you see who's talking, shooting their mouth off and not doing any work versus someone who's talking more precisely with evidence and who's getting work done and people are naturally following. This is not hard. It really isn't hard to spot this. Um, it, it It's very obvious, right? And um, so... I don't know. I, 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 
a lot of these people in this image here are really great. They're natural leaders. Um, I this is from from Portland in 2018, and um, many many years after the OSCON event I described earlier, <laughs> uh, when we went for up in Solaris. I'm here for Oracle actually, and. Community Leadership Summit is something that Jonah Bacon started um, around, this is a long time ago, around Open Solaris, when Open Solaris started, um, maybe 2006, 2007 or so. And because I remember we went to the first one, a bunch of Open Solaris people. Jonah is the guy on the left on sitting next to the sign. He was the original community manager at Ubuntu. That's where I met him, and I've learned a lot from him over the years. And uh, he ran this event. This is this is a two day event, maybe even three day event that runs before OSCON in Portland. And um, so another example, basically, of doing an event, basically piggybacking off of an existing event. Everyone in open source is going to be at O'Reilly OSCON. So if you're going to run, say, like an like a like a little sub event, community leadership on conference, do it there. People are already there. They're coming a couple of days earlier, right? Um, very good. And this was initially started out as a complete unconference where I just, I just I just you know as I described earlier, you show up. I want to do a session on integrating with Mercurial or using you know, GitHub or whatever, right? A community building thing. Um, and you write it on the board and you hope people come. You start to use, you, and then you sell it. You say, I'm going to do this. Who's going to come? I, I, need you to, I need you to come to give me feedback and we'll talk about this and that, right? Uh, you basically sell your own session. It started out like that, just a traditional unconference style. And over the years, it kind of changed a little bit where they had more scheduled keynotes or at least a couple of scheduled keynotes, which was handy to help frame the discussions for the unconference section. Um, so there's different ways of doing unconferences, you know, like a hybrid approach or a complete approach. It doesn't matter. But uh, I've been to, I think just, I think I've been to three of these. And whenever I have my camera, I always like to do a group shot here. And I was very, very lucky because I, this, this particular camera, um, I was uncomfortable with it. Um, this is an A7S Mark II, which is really a video camera. It's not really a good photography camera. And I didn't like the lens. Um, and I was unsure how to get the good focus. I was brand new at the time with this camera. And I took like 10 shots. And I think I only got one or two that actually came out well. So I was pretty happy with this. Um, came out you know, pretty well. It's a little, it's not really quite you know color corrected it's a little yellow but it works um anyway those are leaders those are either community managers you might recognize some of these people i probably know about 10 or so people in there um maybe even more but anyway they're either developers or people who are really into building community they don't have to be specifically community managers per se but just people who do um, you know, people who build communities or run communities. So universities are cool places to go build community because they're filled with young people who have a lot of energy. <laughs> and they, students think very differently from old people. And uh, this is a good thing because the students, you know, they can teach you a lot, you know, if you're older, and most everybody is. They can teach you a lot because of their enthusiasm, their different ways of looking at problems that um, you didn't consider before. They also learn from you when you learn from them, right? Um, really, really cool place to do it. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it because um, of their energy. You know, I, I did a lot of community work in universities in China and in Indonesia and in Singapore and Japan and in India. It, out of all the community building projects that I've done, the university work was by far the most uh, most you know, satisfying. Um, and I didn't expect that. I didn't. I just thought it was yeah, it's just another thing to do. But actually, it turned out to be um, the most fulfilling. And uh, so, you know, cool story here is um, I would. So this is in Indonesia, and. 
Um, and we were there for a week, went to several universities. And I remember having a conversation with one of these students. They wanted to build an open Solaris distribution, right? So basically, you know, I said, look, this is cool. We have buckets of code all over the place here. You can glue it all together, skin it your own way, pull stuff out, add stuff in, make it your own distribution, right? It's the whole, whole point of having open code with an open license, open source license. But, you know, this is a technical issue. So they were, well, how do we do this? And I said, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm a community manager. I'm not an engineer. But you know what I can do is I can I can connect you with the the guys in India because they built a distribution. It's called Velenex, right? It's oh, cool. So so I connected them and they had conversations, right? And then I went to China for an event. And, you know, I was at a university and my student comes up to me and says, oh, I heard about this distribution in Japan. It's called Yaris. And I think there's someone in India, they're doing something with, you know, Bellinix and it's, a it's really cool. So how can we do something like that in China? I says, well, why don't you talk to the people in Indonesia and Japan and India? You guys can all talk, right? And they said, really? Oh, cool. And I said, yeah. This, so you go to this mailing list, you ping this guy, you say, you met Jim in China, and he said to talk to you. And he did that. He actually did that, right? And that spun up a whole huge conversation and went back six months later to China, and, you know, they got a little distribution going, right? Very, very cool. That You know, just – that whole excitement, enthusiasm, we can do this ourselves. We can earn our own way in this community based on our skills and abilities, right? Because once you build something, it's there for everybody to see. That's that's the great thing about constructing something. I, I used to be in the construction business. I built houses. I was in the excavating business. I was in the real estate business. I had my own business. I built things. And when you build it, Wow, it's there. It's very, very visceral. Even in software, which is etherical, it's more, you know, you're working with code. Once you build it, everyone knows you can see it. It's right there. It's awfully, awfully fulfilling. And that's why you do work with universities because you have people coming up to you saying, how can we do this? You know, you know, they don't say, can I do this? They ask you how they can do this. Very different very different. They already have the assumption that they can do it. So when you're at universities, also think in terms of building community with multiple levels. Students is just one. They got the professors as well. Talk to the professors, the engineering professors. Talk to the administrators. And in many times, like in China, the administrators are, you know, there's some, sometimes depending on the country you're in, the universities will be, have you know, relationships with the government, right? And so uh, we you can you can solve multiple problems you can you can build at multiple levels by by having relationships with universities at 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 the administrative level let's say right we used to build user groups on these at these universities um and um ultimately which would lead to corporate sales of systems into the universities it's all about building relationships Okay, local and global. So you're not going to have just one community if you're going to scale. If you're going to build a community that you know, cuts across nationalities, and um, which today is very easy to do because of software, um, you have to think in terms of local and global. And I got this this local global concept from Chris Thallinger. He's the guy in the um, the bathing suit, the the orange bathing suit, right there in the middle, off to the right. Um, this is his event. It's Unboxed Hawaii. It used to be called Lava One. It Lava One after Java One because it started out as a Java conference, but it grew into an unconference that was just about technology, not necessarily only Java, but it grew from the Java community. Most of those people there, well, I'd say about half of them. Are actually Java developers and other people. There's more cloud people. And there's also some scientists there, some PhDs doing local work in Hawaii. And that's the point. Chris wanted to build an unconference, yearly unconference, where he brings technology innovators that he knew, because Chris 
at the time. He was at Twitter, very well known in the Java community. I want to bring them into Hawaii, right? To to basically bring this talent there and to encourage the local talent to come as well, so they can mix, right, in an unconference style. And you know, unconferences are designed. You know, obviously, I said earlier about you know the ball of participants create the schedule and stuff like that and, and, and stuff, but there's a lot of downtime at unconferences and that's intentional. So you can mix socially because an awful lot of innovation happens at, you know, you know, around coffee or around, you know, campfire or in this case surfing because we're in Hawaii. So, uh, or hiking, or, you know, the multiple events and, you know, people would go out hiking and they're having coding conversations. I know because I was there, I can't follow this. They're, you know, we're trying to hike here and you're looking at this beautiful vista and we're talking about coding because right? they're, because they're into it, you know, and they're in a, in an environment where there's no pressure, there's no deadline. They can just let it flow, let it, you know, let it all come out. Right. Um, and, they create stuff this way and it's, it's software is a creative process. It, it's not a paper pushing sort of job. It's, it's a science. Computer science is a science clearly, but it's also a creative process in terms of how you write code. Um, so Chris was very good at this and bringing people together. We ran this event for three days. Um, and that facility that we're at, there is, um, specifically a public private a public private you know, partnership it's actually owned and run by um the state of hawaii and they bring companies in to do events just like this right it's kind of like a workspace as well there's multiple floors it's got great light for photography lots of space for whiteboards and projection they have conference rooms it's a great place and um um we had a we had a great time, and but the point was, and the sessions were very interesting because they were mixed. We had sessions on diversity, um, we had sessions on Java, we had sessions on environmental issues, pollution, plastics, um, photography. I I ran a session on videography, um, and and so it, it was really great, really great. And um, but the point is local and global because you won't have um, you won't have just one community and you shouldn't try and impose upon a local area something that you're bringing in from the outside. You come in from the outside in order to collaborate with the local area, right? That's the important thing. And then you want to, you know, when you leave, you want to encourage the local developers to develop in their own way. So then they eventually can go out as experts as well and take what they learned out and then what they learned out there they can bring actually back um, some of that will happen naturally but if you want to leverage it as a technique it it's it's very very valuable this was probably the coolest single event i was ever involved with this is in china um, this is a coding contest and this is in a place called Hefe. I don't know if I'm saying that saying that correctly, but um, I'm going to illustrate this you know, by talking about marketing. I've I've worked in marketing for a long time. Um, I've done community development. I've done marketing. I've done advocacy. I've worked also in engineering as well as a project manager. Um, People in marketing think very differently from people in from people in engineering. But if you're going to build a community, you need both of these people. All right. If you're a community manager, you're not a marketer and you're not an engineer. Even even though you might actually be an engineer, you're not doing engineering at that time. You're doing community development, and that's a different function. You need both of the disciplines involved. You need multiple disciplines involved. But those are the two main ones, and the marketing team will bring to your project things that you and the engineers aren't expertise in things like trademarks, things like advertising, competitive issues, um, uh, analyst relations, media relations, public relations, these kinds of things that can help your community tremendously with a skill set that you don't have 
or you might not have, or your engineer certainly won't have, other than maybe a cursory knowledge of it. But it's, it's, it's not their main job, right? So copyright issues, which I think the engineers know a lot about, but there are um, there's still, still things that um, marketing can bring. I think marketing people also think in terms of revenue because they have to report to executive management about sales and field issues. And community people think more about contributions, um, facilitating actual project development. So both of them are necessary, but they're slightly different. Now, about this specific event, this was a major, major um, um, coding contest in China. It was all throughout China. I think I actually think it was a global event, but, but we were just participating in the China um, in the China in the China section of it. IBM was the lead sponsor. And that's important here. Sun was was a secondary sponsor. Um, all those computer all those computer screens you see there are running Open Solaris. Now this is before cloud, so they all have systems. You know they have you know towers down there, and right? so those are just screens. This is in two thousand and eight. Um, obviously, you know you'd be using the cloud system now, but um, so. Through our marketing relationships with these universities, now this is the Sun marketing people in China, okay, my colleagues in China. We had been doing community work for years with these universities. We were working with the students. We were working with the administrators. We were working with um, other officials um, at the universities. They were teaching Open Solaris at some of these universities. University professors were designing courses. They were teaching Unix using Open Solaris. They were teaching um, development tools using the Sun Studio tools um, and various Java IDEs at the time. So what, you know, through those relationships, which started from nothing, I'm going to make this very, very clear here. We had no relationships with these universities. And with just in a few years, the Sun team in China, with help from others, but it was their lead. This was their idea, right? I used to go to China a lot. I've been in China 30 times. I was constantly at these places. It was great. I loved it. Um, and so through these relationships, we got ourselves involved with sponsoring as being a, a secondary sponsor um, like a, of this tour, right? And um, I went to a few of the events. And as a result of this sponsorship, we were able to get these kids to do this coding contest on our software, Open Solaris. And it's just it's great because we started this project from nothing. Now you can see all these computer screens running Open Solaris, and it's this huge, huge contest, right? Those relationships led to Sun selling servers into, because again, this is before cloud, selling servers into these universities, right? It led to business relationships. So as a community manager, this is where people say, oh, you know, what's the value of communities? I always get so pissed off when I hear this. God damn it. Come on, man. I mean, it's just like you're building relationships with students. Those students have relationships with teachers. Those teachers have relationships with actually, – actually have relationships with the administrators who have government relationships. The salespeople get involved. It's just not hard. It's not hard to explain this, right? And then eventually through these relationships, you're, you're selling stuff, right? You're building at the community development level, you're building your community, but the company, in this case it's Sun, you're selling computers into that customer. That's also a customer that you're looking at there. Well, many customers, because those kids, if you look at the signs, they're from all over China. I see Nanjing there, and I see, you know, I see, I, I see Beijing there. And really, really cool concept. Very, very cool. And um, this was one of the proudest moments. I, I told the people in California that it's our stuff running on those screens right there. Because, you know, I got to be honest, you know, people were always saying you're going to fail. When we started Open Solaris, we got nothing but shit from most of the market. 
People, you know, people, uh, you know, they didn't believe us. Uh, son's closed. Son's just going to close the code and this and that. And so it was really hard. So when we when we got some momentum, we had huge successes like this. It was really, really cool. So the kids loved it. We loved it. We gave out awards and stuff because we were a sponsor. IBM was there. And you know, it was just, it was just a, just a cool thing. So, you know, the, I guess the point of this is, you know, a lot of times in engineering and community, we kind of make fun of marketing people or we denigrate them. And I've been in marketing for many years. A lot of it is deserved. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I actually prefer to be on the engineering side. But great marketing can do things for you that you cannot do. And so that's the point here that you go out, try and find some really good marketing people. We had some cool marketing people at Sun. Um, every company has them. Um, and, um, just like leadership, I mentioned earlier that you have to go out looking for these people. They're not necessarily always going to come to you. You got to go out looking for them. And so marketing should be on your list. Okay. Advocacy. Advocacy is slightly different from marketing, I believe. Um, I, so marketing is more of a, a, a relationship between say a company and, or a project and a customer. Um, very loose, sort of loose terminology. Advocacy is many to many conversations, not one to many. Now, these are two um, friends. Uh, I, I was really impressed with them. Um, when I met them in, in China, this is Fiona and Rita. And um, they're both engineers, and they worked um, on our team in in China and in Beijing. And they were incredible community builders, both of them. Um, the whole team over there was very, very good. But Rita and Fiona were really cool because they were able to build community in a social way as well as talk about the technology in a very deeply technical way because they're both engineers and um, they understood completely naturally this concept of many to many conversations and then scale of, of advocacy where engineers are advocating their engineers. They're up there, they're doing speeches, but they're also organizing. Right. Um, and I saw this constantly in China. I saw it in Japan. I saw it in Korea that the East Asian cultures, actually in India as well, so it's not necessarily East Asian, but the a lot of the engineers really didn't see a difference between engineering and community development. You just do everything. You're in this big soup. You're in this big space. Everybody does everything, right? And I was just so impressed by – um, their ability to run very large events. I just, I just shook my head and I said, I don't know how you do it because, wow, maybe it's age. I mean, these guys here are really significantly younger than me, but we had a great time. They treated me well. And, um, <clears throat> so they are responsible for building, um, user groups in China that led to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I know because I counted. I was the user group community manager on Open Solaris. I know exactly how many people we had in those groups. So many to many conversations, very, very important. That's what advocacy is. It's not one to many, but, but, you do need the one-to-many conversation, which is more of a marketing function. You need both. Treat them equally. Okay, legal is, I'm not a lawyer, right? You have people say that all, all the time. You hear this at conferences. Um, I'm in an elevator here, and um, you know, there's always a camera in an elevator, like you're always on camera, you know, those wide angle lenses. And I actually incidentally have a wide angle lens you know, with me. I'm shooting into a mirror, obviously. I love taking selfies this way. Um, <laughs> the reason why illegal is important is because someone's actually every, everyone's going to be looking at you. If you're going to build a serious community, there are legal issues that 
are going to come up. Um, if it's like if it's like a uh, software community, trademarks, copyright, contributor agreements, you've got source licenses, you know, source code licenses, and content licenses, right? You've got the open source initiative lists a whole boatload of, of, of licenses, which is the proper one for your community. They all do different things. They all create a different community, a different, you know, a different way of interacting, um, a different legal framework, basically, um, in terms of who owns the code, where does that code go? How do you want to encourage code to flow? Right. Content is the same thing. Are you using creative commons? You should, you should, that's the whole point of it. It's the open source, you know, it's the, it's the same thing as it's the, it's the open source licenses for content, right. From the creative commons and the whole thing with patents. Um, this stuff is complex. Now there's a lot of uh, books that are written on these things. Many of them are free, um, online. And, um, my point here is to, uh, have some conversations with your lawyers, basically. It's very, very important. Um, the code that you're releasing, you need to make sure that you own it. All right. When we opened Solaris, Sun didn't own all that code, right? It, it had evolved many, many years and they had license agreements with many, many people. And we had to go back and sort of, you know, the, clean the code. I think the expression we use at the time, figure out who owned what, where the licenses were uh, back then stuff was on paper. Right. Um, so it took, I don't know, probably about six months to sort of go through the code. We, you know, um, on our team, you know, Alan Burleson wrote the tools to go and, and, and search the code base and, you know, organize it and, and figure out who owned what. And, and, um, so our team that opened the code, you know, I was in the Open Solaris project, which was a, like a sub team of the of the Open Solaris engineering team. Um, we were the ones that um, I did community stuff. I say we, but you know, we had to analyze the code. We had to get that, um, so it was in a position to where we could actually release it, and then take contributions, which is the second step. So. You know, I remember Claire and Simon and Denise and um, Karen and Andy, um, Stephen. They were all in lawyer offices a lot figuring this out, right? So um, if you're going to run a serious project, especially if you're at a big company, um, get to know your lawyers. You can teach them a lot, but they can teach you a lot as well. So we're wrapping up here, and I wanted to just say um, <clears throat> a few things about um, basically when I started, I talked about people. And um, if you do this right and provide a space where people can come into your community, they will develop friendships. Your job at that point is to let go. All right. You just, you just, forming a space where people can come and gather and contribute, they will develop relationships all by themselves. You don't need to push that. Um, these guys here, um, this was from 2019. Um, this is the Oracle ACE dinner, which we had um, a woman on our team, Jen Nicholson, used to run that program, and she ran this, this um, dinner. It was a great dinner. I loved it. I had plenty of meat. I was very happy. Um, <clears throat> but this is, you know, Sai, Sai Penamunu and another Sai and Tony and Bashir is here and Kieran, Connor, um, and of course, Sandesh, he was the ever present, all right. He's everywhere. Um, these are great guys. I've traveled to many, many conferences around the world with these guys. Um, they're just, you know, five or six guys that have, out of, hundreds that I, I've been showing you pictures of. I have thousands of pictures of these people, of thousands of people, right? I'm friends with them all. They are friends with each other. So that's really why you do this, okay? That's that's because, you know, that's the glue that holds everything together, really, honestly. 
Um, because you know who wants to come into your community and contribute code if 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 you know it's hostile. Nobody. Right? I might as well get a job then. Right? You contribute to communities because you want to. That's the whole point. And you know you build friendships that last a lifetime. And um, so that's the point um, of this. I just I like the image because I just you know I I just hey guys. And I held up my camera, and they formed this pose all by themselves. And I needed to one shot. Click. That's it. It was done. And it's perfect. They all have good expressions. They're all putting their hands on each other because they're close friends. So that's it. That's all I wanted to talk to you about here. I wanted to been looking forward to sort of recording this and going over some pictures. I have many more stories, um, but I just wanted to get, and I have paid no attention whatsoever to the length of this because I don't care because I'm doing it for me, basically. Um, so some of the resources, I'll just end with a couple of things here. Some of the resources I, I like here um like The Art of Community by Jonah Bacon. I think that was his first book. It's very good. And if you've built communities, you'll recognize a lot of the concepts in there. And there's a lot in there that you can learn as well. The Clue Train Manifesto is my personal favorite. I got that book from Simon Phipps. He gave it to me as a gift in 2000 after we just joined Sun. Um, I met him in um, the summertime, the summer of of, uh, of 2000 in um Cupertino. We were in the Cupertino office at, at Sun. And he was reading Clue Train Manifesto. And I said, oh, that looks interesting. And he described what it was about. And I said, oh, shit, that's something that it's open source marketing. That's what that is, right? Uh, having open conversations. And so he went to the bookstore, he got me a copy. And um, it's no shit, the best book on marketing you will ever find anywhere. It's open source marketing. That's what it is, right? Um, the Cathedral and the Bazaar from um, Eric Raymond is also very, very good. Early hacking community gets you the real, real um, culture of the hacking community. The real hackers, not the, not the people who break things. Developer Advocate is from um, a friend of mine as well. And so um, it's a big, thick book, actually. Uh, lots of, uh, of people contributed to that. Open Sources, the two versions of Open Sources. Um, Denise Cooper was behind those with uh, Tim O'Reilly and a bunch of other leaders in the open source community. Just an example of one of the books that I sort of skimmed on licensing. I find licensing very, very um, confusing. And um, But there are many resources out there. This Faces of, uh, Faces of Open Source is actually a photography series. If you just search on that on the web, you'll, you'll find it. It's a beautiful um, portraits of open source people around the world you'll recognize them it's just just great stuff and um um kind of jealous because that's kind of like what i like to do but that's that's like real photography very very nice uh, and these two videos here on the right moved by java is a, a recent uh i guess about a year ago now the java team um for their 25th anniversary of java they they put together this video where java um engineers and community members would basically be talking about what moves them, you know, moved by Java basically is the concept. And it's really great stories. James Gosling is in there and there's, there's obviously there's a lot, you know, you know, dozens of people in there and it's edited really well as well. And the trillions and trillions served is I think the 20th or 25th anniversary of Apache, probably 25 years. Um, it's their sort of you know, documentary as well. Very well done. Um, really, you really get a sense of the history and also the culture of the Apache um, Software Foundation. And um, so, there's just a couple of resources. But I mean, if you if you if you poke at these, you'll find many, many more. And some references. The first link here um, on top, detailed notes for this presentation. A lot of what I've said, I've written out. Some of the examples. Um, I've been adding things I've, as I've been speaking here. Uh, the more, the longer I speak, the more I add. So, um, but the text for it basically is at that top link, and then there's just more links to other things that 
resources that um, you can go explore. And um, I'll leave it with the Sun Reunion. These two images here um, was, I, it's very significant for me because this took place in the fall of 2019. That's before the world changed, right before the world changed, literally. I think it was October, I think, um, late October of 2019. And uh, Sun had a reunion. They have this every now and then. But what was significant about this one is was a thousand people there. So let's just let's just riff on this for a moment. This company has been dead for 10 years. They put a thousand people in the room, and there were over a hundred executives there. The company's been dead for 10 years. So now what, what other company could put a thousand people in a room 10 years after it was died? You know, I, I was floored by it. I, I, I have, I shot a couple of hundred images. They're on Flickr. Uh, one of the links here on the left hand side is to my Flickr page. So you can go look at them. Uh, I saw James there. I hadn't seen him in years. It was great to catch up with him. And um, I saw Bill Joy there. I met Bill a little bit during the Juxta project. Um, I wouldn't. See, he doesn't know me, but I mean, I certainly know him and um, Andy and uh, John Gage. I, I used to know John. I used to work on some projects with him. Uh, with the Java community. Uh, Eric Schmidt, I've met a few times, but haven't actually worked with him, and, and he obviously doesn't know me. But it was cool to be there and see everybody and met probably several dozen of my old friends from Sun. They're all sprinkled all over the valley now. And um, I had a really good time. And I'm not one for reunions. I've never been to my high school or college reunion or anything like that. I don't go to these things. I don't. And I'll probably never go again to Sun. I just wanted to go once. And I did. And I really had a good time. And uh, that's the company. That experience is how I learned all this open source stuff. Um, it's a tragic loss. Um, never should have happened, but that's what happens in this world. Good things sometimes don't make it. And, um, you know, that's just life, right? So that's it. That's all I have to say. And um, it's just my experience. Go build something yourself, experiment, and um, give it back. That's the whole point is to learn, go out and come back and give back.